Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Stefan Levera podcast, a show about Bitcoin and Austrian economics. Now, today we've got an awesome guest. We've got an incredible topic around brute forcing Bitcoin seeds. Now, it's not the whole seed. It's obviously just a section of the seed. Your Bitcoins are safe. But the question is, what are these seeds made of and how? Uh, what are some of the things we need to think about when we're trying to secure our Bitcoins? So our guest today, John, is going to talk us through uh, his fantastic approach on that. But first, let me introduce the sponsors of the show. So firstly, we've got Swan Bitcoin. So I think you guys already know Swan is the place to auto stack your Bitcoin in the US. They've got incredibly easy setup and low fees. They're also making a splash in the content scene. They've got Swan Signal, which is a podcast pairing up Bitcoiners for unique and compelling discussions. So they, they're doing it live every week on Twitter and YouTube, and you can get it as a download at swansignalpodcast.com. Now, Swan have also launched Swan Force. With Swan Force, you get paid to recruit Bitcoiners. So the link there is swanbitcoin.com slash enlist. Next up is Unchained Capital. So Bitcoin native financial services. Unchained are offering ways for us to easily secure our keys using multi-signature. So you can get, say, one Trezor and one Ledger, and then Unchained can be the third key in that scenario. And you can go on unchained-capital.com and set up your vault with them. And they've also, they're also offering the loans product. So you can put up some Bitcoin and get USD collateral and that means you don't have to sell your Bitcoin. So that's another great advantage there. And on the Unchained side, they've got an incredible range of material. So go and check them out at unchained-capital.com. Lastly, for my Australian listeners, did you know you can buy Bitcoin with your superannuation? Well, with a Bitcoin-friendly self-managed super fund, you can. They've made it simple. They've streamlined the process for you. And remember, you can still hold your own keys in your superannuation. So as long as you're comfortable making the investment decisions, They've got, they're offering a free 20 minute consultation. Go to newbrightoncapital.com and use the coupon code Lavera to get a discount on your fees. All right. So, with that said, I'm going to bring in my guest, John. Uh, John is a developer and he's uh, also known for working on the Juggernaut project. And he's got this fantastic article that he wrote recently that I wanted to get him on and discuss. So, John, welcome to the show. Hey, it's great to be here. So, John, uh, Tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and your background as a developer. Sure, yeah, I've been doing software development now for almost 20 years. Um, and I've spent probably the last seven of it uh, focused, well, not entirely seven uh, focused on Bitcoin, but um, sort of always in the privacy space and, and more recently in Bitcoin. But I've been kind of following along uh, for about seven years now. That's fantastic. Yeah, no, I, I, I really enjoyed your recent article. I thought it was just phenomenal, really clever approach. Uh, so I'd love to break that down a little bit. Could you set this up for us? What was the scenario? Uh, what, was, uh, what, was, uh, what was this giveaway about? Well, I think it was mostly about uh, Alistar trying to get some more followers on his different social <laughs> media platforms, which... It, it, it seemed like it didn't really work out so well for him in the end, but uh, that was his plan. It was, hey, let's give away a Bitcoin and see if I can get people excited enough and make them follow me to try to get clues. Uh, and he was going to release, you know, a word every couple of days or I don't know the exact rate, but that seemed to be what he did. And so I think his idea was, you know, eventually there'd be enough words. Well, he was trying to prevent brute forcing, actually, by he, he said he was going to release the last four words all at once. Uh, because he incorrectly assumed that uh, it would be impossible or it would take a long, like a couple of weeks, I think he thought, uh, to brute force with eight words. Uh, yeah. So and I guess just like for the, the setup, uh, yeah, and I just just for the setup for the listeners, I suppose, Alistair was saying, you have to follow me across all of these different platforms and I'm going to release one word or two words across each of them. Uh, so um, let's... I guess explain for those of us in new new to Bitcoin. So those people who are new to Bitcoin, remember it's very important. We always talk about learning how to self custody your Bitcoin. So that's a very important thing in Bitcoin, not your keys, not your coins. Now, typically, when you are setting up a new wallet, they not all, most wallets will give you either a twelve or twenty four word seed, and then that is how you back up and. Uh, protect your bitcoins so john perhaps you could uh, break that down a little bit for us what is that seed and you know how do we sort of generate one and kind of what's that process there 
Yeah, sure. So it's, it's, I can't say it's true for every wallet, right? Every wallet can kind of choose to do this however they like. It's sort of, um, there's sort of any, you, there's lots of different ways you could convert you know, a word into a string of words into a seed, but uh, luckily we have a standard. And so there's these BIP standards. They're sort of Bitcoin improvement protocols. Um, and we have one, I forget when it was released, we can go check, but uh, it's called BIP39 and it's sort of defined a standard for uh, a way to generate a seed from a mnemonic or a string of, of words. And so at the end of the day, what really is going on here is you need some, you need some randomness or some entropy. Um, and how you get that uh, is, is really important because humans are, are pretty terrible at, at generating randomness. Like, I think there's something like if you ask people to guess a number between one and 10, like most people say seven or something like that. Right. So it's like, um, you don't want to be the, you don't want to do it yourself. You want to, you want to offload this one, one nice way that I actually like a lot is, is rolling dice, uh, make sure they're properly weighted and everything. But, um, that's a great way to generate, uh, pretty, pretty, pretty random data. Um, I think a lot of the wallets just use whatever kind of system level pseudo randomness uh, is provided. There's other neat tricks I've seen around using hardware on the device, like the accelerometer, like oh, go ahead and shake your device around randomly. And, you know, maybe that's good enough for some entropy or um, move your mouse around on the screen. You might've seen, I've, I think I've even seen them on like a banking website or something once. But um, so basically the idea is you need some source of randomness. And in, in um, BIP39, they, you can kind of choose how much you want based on how secure you want it to be in a sense. Um, and so sort of the bare minimum uh, is 128 bits and that would give you, that's how you get to the 12 words and that's the 12 word uh, seed. And so if, if you see a wallet that uses 24 words, that means you likely have, I think it's 256 bits uh, of entropy. And so what that means is, or how it works, I guess in BIP39 is once you have those 128 random bits, uh, however you got them, whether it was through dice rolling or some kind of uh, random function built into the device, they then calculate a four bit checksum. So you get up to 132 bits. And then they say, we want to divide that into uh, 12 words, right? You need to get this into words. And the reason they do the words is so that it's easier to, mem uh, to remember for people. Like an easily, it's easy to write down. You don't have to write down this 128 you know, bit string. It's just these 12 English words or whatever word, you know, there's different word lists for different languages actually. Um, yeah. And so, and, to, and what they do is basically they just split that randomness, that random bit strings of ones and zeros uh, into groups of 11 bits. And it could be anything really, you know, if you want, it just depends on the size of the word list. And so with 11 bits, you can represent the numbers all the way up to 2048. And that's why, well, actually zero to 2047, but, uh, that's why the list has 2048 words on it. And so basically every 11 bits is just mapping into one of these words on the list. And that's that's all you're really doing. It's just kind of like a convenient way or an easy way for humans to to write down or even memorize if they want uh, 120 bits of randomness, essentially. And so that's sort of the first step. I don't know if you, you want me to pause yep. there and you have any questions about that, but that's that's how it starts. Right. And I guess maybe just backing up one, one bit is the it's kind of starting out with a big, big number, right? So if you want to think of it more simply, it's just you're starting out with yep. a huge, huge number, and then you're sort of breaking that down into this, like there's a method that, that the BIP39 um, standard spells out, which is the way by which you break that down into either 12 or 24 words, and that's what mm -hmm. most Bitcoiners know as their mnemonic, which is, I guess, technically it's different from the actual number, right? It's, it's just a representation of that, I guess. Yeah, it is. There's still just the number, right? It's just a binary number, which you could convert to decimal. It's going to be some extremely large number. Um, and then, yeah, the mnemonic isn't really the number. I mean, it is. It's just a different way of, like I said, it's breaking it down into groups and then mapping each one of those to a word. So at the end of the day, it is still that, you know, that big number. Um, and, yeah. and but then from there, so if we go into how do you turn that that mnemonic string or that 128 bits of randomness, into an actual Bitcoin's private key pair, so private key and a public key, um, there's kind of another process to find. And so I don't think we wanna go into elliptic curve math, but uh, basically there's some, some math here that uh, is what 
how private and public keys work. And so just like the mnemonic, a private, your private key is actually just a really large number, um, really large. And, and from that, you, you can do math with the curve that Bitcoin uses to get the public key that you can give out. And that's how you can generate addresses and things like that. Um, but basically the, the issue is that 128 bits is too small, uh, to be this, to be your private key. And so they have some, some method, um, to basically use a lot of hash functions and, and make it slow to compute. So this was actually the, the, the most difficult, uh, and challenging part in terms of brute forcing something like this is how do you take this 128 bit mnemonic and get it into the master seed? And so they do this. A lot of websites will do this when you when you store when they store your password. So websites don't actually store, well, they shouldn't actually store your raw password that you typed in. They usually hash it and store a hash of it so that if the database is leaked, your password isn't actually leaked. It's just this hash that no one can reverse. And I guess we should step back a little bit and just all hashing is sort of used a lot in this process. And it's sort of it, you can think of it like a one way function. Basically, it's easy to go from it's easy to take some input and calculate the output, but it's impossible or theoretically impossible to, to go backwards. So if you're given some hash output, you can't figure out what the input was. And so what they also do is other than checking every possible input essentially, which is what brute forcing is. Um, and so websites will, they, they want to make it slow for brute forcers to check. And so they, they come up with really slow hash functions or hash functions just done thousands of times. And so this is where you'll hear things like script, which is, I, I think it's the same script that's used in Litecoin, um, is, is uh, a slow hash function. But I think most of the standard on the web these days is uh, something called bcrypt. And it just basically makes it so maybe it takes a half second to do one hash. And so as a user logging into a website, when they have to calculate the hash, it only takes a half second. It's not a big deal. But if you needed to check a trillion of them, you know, you're out of luck. There's no way you're going to do a trillion at a half second each. And so that's sort of the same thing that BIP39 does. It does 2,048 iterations of this hash function, uh, SHA-512, um, to, to convert uh, the 128-bit mnemonic into... Uh, basically more random data, but it's now 64 bytes of random data, which is enough to use as your master private key. Fantastic. So it's uh, analogous in some ways to salting, which is that practice you were mentioning around um, like the websites not storing your, you know, your, your mm -hmm. password exactly as it is, but they salt it first, right. which is the hashing aspect. And I think the other important point that you were pointing out is the asymmetric nature of it, that it's easy to go one way, but it's hard to go back the other way um oh we've just yep. got a comment in the chat why does he sound well uh john's got some uh voice mod modifier software <laughs> so that's uh <laughs> that's why um john's uh voice is a little bit different um but uh, i think it's it's a great idea to uh protect your privacy so that's totally fine um so the other so i guess the next step then is thinking about things like derivation paths and so on so could you tell us a little bit about how you tried to infer what sort of address, what sort of key path the Bitcoin was stored at? Yeah, so that was, so I mean, the first question is really, he says, I'm going to release a couple words, you know, it's, it was generated, all he said was it was generated using a 12 word uh, mnemonic. And so, but that alone doesn't necessarily mean uh, it was BIP39. Like I think Electrum, which is another really yep. popular wallet, it doesn't actually use, yeah, they don't use it. And so, you know, it could have been an Electrum wallet. I didn't know, you know, at the start. And so, and even like uh, LND, you know, has its own, like there's different, people have different ideas and different ways. And there's, there actually are ways to improve it. And so anyways, it wasn't clear that that was what he was doing. But as the word started coming out, it's pretty obvious because you can just check it against the word list and be like, okay, if they're coming from the BIP39 English word list, then you're pretty confident that that's what it is. I mean, he could have been tricky and like made his own word list or something, you know, to make it nearly impossible for this to happen. But anyways, I assumed he wasn't doing anything fancy since he was targeting non-technical people and, he, you know, he was trying to use a standard wallet, I was pretty sure. And so I was like, it's probably just the BIP39 wallet. I didn't want to overthink it too much. Um, yeah. But yeah, and when you, when, you know, go ahead. Yeah, I was just saying, and then you you also figured out that um, what sort of address and so on, like it was a pay, P2SH, uh, pay to script hash nested P2WSH, right? 
Yeah, so I'm not actually like a expert on all of the uh, wallet address formats. There's like so many of them, but yeah, what the next step was like, okay, I a lot of people when they try to brute force or do wallet recovery, like there's a couple services that do this, uh, they they also as part of it scan kind of the block, like they store the blockchain uh, UTXO set so that they can be like, let me generate all these addresses and, sh and just kind of search. They're searching to find addresses that have uh, Bitcoin in them. And in this case, I knew I didn't need to do that. And it was a step I could eliminate because he gave us the address to start. And so I was like, I don't really care. You know, I don't need to do the standard recovery process. And so I just need to figure out how to generate that address uh, from from an, a, a seed, basically. You know, how do I go from, that ad from a seed to that address and uh, just try every seed until I can get that address. And so to do that is, it is, is, uh, goes into this idea of BIP32, which is another improvement protocol and kind of standard for Bitcoin wallets. And it's it's really clever and extremely useful. And the main idea there is let's be let's take one seed and be able to generate nearly infinite wallets from it. And the idea is you can have what and there's different it builds like a full tree of of public and private key pairs. And so you can it manages things like your change addresses. It even supports multi coins if you you know you want to go down that path. You can you can split accounts if you want to have one set of addresses for you, one for your wife, or you have a business. And the other really nice thing is it allows you to generate public keys without needing um, the private keys present. So you can actually, if you run a, I, I assume a BTC pay server and things like that do this, but if you're if you're running a store and you don't want to, you, you have a wallet that you want to receive Bitcoin on, but you don't want to have to have your private keys on your server in case it gets hacked, you know, this is a perfect solution where you can, it can generate nearly infinite addresses without needing to um, expose your private key uh, anywhere. And so it's, yep. it's a really clever trick. Yeah. Yep. So I guess I'll just make sure everyone can follow along. I want the uh, intelligent layman to be able to follow along how that works. So basically think of it like your Bitcoin wallet actually manage, it's a key chain. So it manages many, many different uh address uh sorry private and public key pairs and so you can think of it like the there's a process to go from public key to address right there's like hashing and coding and uh, so on but just for listeners just so you understand what's going on just think of it like your wallet man is a keychain and this master public key is kind of like the top level uh if you will uh, account and you can set up little sub accounts in there and each of those is you can generate a new uh, address and in, in in reality, it's like a private and public key pair, correct? Yep. Yeah, that's about that's that's pretty much right. I mean, it's 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 a little more complicated than that. It's it, it's more of a tree structure where you can kind of keep branching based on the account numbers and things like that. Um, and that was sort of the next problem, right? Was like, well, where which account did he use, and which you know, f is it the first address? Is it the millionth address? He, it, it, he didn't give any um, indication of that, right? And so that to me was, as I mentioned in the article, was, was sort of the biggest risk of this whole project um, because I didn't know, so, you know, which ad, uh, which derivation path he was using. And so it's, you know, it's great. You can go from mnemonic to seed to master private key, and then you have to pick, you know, there's only one address for each path. Well, yeah, for each path. And so, and it takes a lot of time. There's a lot of math and hashing that needs to be done for each address. And so if you're trying to brute force a trillion possibilities, you're trying to save as much time as possible. So I was like, I'm going to take a risk here and to save as much time as possible, just check one address. And um, I sort of just assumed in my head, if I was him, you know, what, how would I set this up? And uh, well, maybe not if I was him, but like, if I was just trying to do this as easy as possible, I'm going to boot up a new Trezor, you know, hit generate wallet, send, you know, it's going to give me the first address and I'm going to send the Bitcoin to it. And so I sort of just assumed that's what he did. Um, and so in that sense, what Trezor would do is just use the first account and the first index, you know, the first address in that account. And so I just assumed that the derivation path was the standard derivation path for the first address, essentially. Um, and so that was the only address I was checking for each mnemonic that I was iterating through in this brute force. And so it was a huge risk because if it was the second, like if he was like, oh, I'm just going to do a test address, a test first and then generate a second address and move the Bitcoin there, you know, I would have been totally, totally screwed. Or if he was using 
uh, an existing treasure and he already had a bunch of addresses and accounts and he was like, oh, I'll make a new account, a new wallet in my treasure and move it there, I, you know, I would have missed it. So there was lots of ways this could have could have failed. And luckily he, he bootstrapped a new, uh, new account, it seems like. Right, I see. So I guess uh, what Alistair probably did, right, inferring from what you were saying and from what you were successful in the end, is that he used, let's say, just a, a typical Trezor or a Ledger or just a typical BIP39 wallet and used mm -hmm. only the first address. And so you were able to kind of look on the common um, pathway for that type of address. Uh, and if he didn't reveal the address, then you would have had to look at mo across different uh, uh, pathways, right? If he didn't, yeah, if he didn't reveal the address, it would have been a lot harder because another piece that we're not talking about is not just the derivation path, but also sort of what type of address he was using. And so like an address isn't just, uh, you know, back in the early days of Bitcoin, it was it was simple. It was just pay to public key hash. Um, and now there's a lot of other kind of standard address types. And in this case, it was, luckily I just opened it in, uh, in a block explorer and was able they they have all the fancy stats now and they show you you know what it is and you it was pretty obvious looking at that that it was this pay to script hash wrapped uh wrapped segwit um address type and so with that so basically what my point was when you know when you pick a derivation path even from there you don't necessarily get straight to an address you had to pick yep. what type of output it would have been so i actually booted up my own treasure and took a look and saw that that's also the type it was generating so i was like okay <laughs> this is this is probably it and so like the code that i was writing also had to you know you had to tell it which i had to pick you know how do i want to encode the um the output script uh when i was generating the address and so these were there was lots of things I was kind of guessing at. Uh, yeah, that's I mean this is phenomenal really. I mean this is very clever work. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about how you figured out if this brute force attack is feasible? Yeah, that was sort of my first my first um, thing. I was like, well, he says he's going to release the last three or four. He said in the beginning he said three or four. So I was like, okay, three seems. I, I had no idea actually. I was like, you know, I'd never really done this. I never done any research or really reading into what is feasible today. I always just know everyone's like, well, two, two, uh, 128 bits or 256 bits is, you know, a really big number. Computers can't do it. You always see that infographic with like the sun, like in the imp impenetrable force. And like, I kind of just take it as like, yeah, it's probably pretty big. And it's like, you know, you never really have a sense for how big it really is until you try to do something like this. And for me, that was one of like the coolest takeaways is like, wow, this really is impossible. Um, and so um, that's what I wanted to figure out. I was like, what is possible, you know, what is reasonable um, assuming I can actually figure all this out and what, you know, how fast can I do each for, for each missing word? And so, Basically, what happens is each word that you know, you can remove 11 bits from the unknown random string, right? So there's 128 bits we're trying to figure out. And so each word that he releases, you can you know 11 bits now. You can just fix them. You know, assuming he was releasing them in order, which is another assumption I was making. But um, And so after the first word, it's 117 bits left. And then after the next one, it's 106 bits and et cetera. And, um, and so that kind of tells you how many numbers you have to iterate through, right? It's like two to the two to the whatever is how uh, two to the number of bits that you're trying to guess is how many numbers you kind of have to iterate and check. And so what I did was wrote a quick program uh, in Rust. Uh, I wasn't actually I'm not a Rust developer, but I knew it was uh, supposedly easy to use and fast. And that's what I was like, I need something fast. You know, I can't, I'm typically a JavaScript developer. And I know this is not a good idea to, to do anything uh, that you need performance uh, in JavaScript. Anyways, and so there's a bunch of libraries already pre written in Rust, there's Rust Bitcoin, Rust Lightning, which is what Square Crypto is kind of working on. Um, and so I just use those to make a quick um, quick test app to just to see how quick the process was, was from going from mnemonic to address. Mm -hmm. um, and it, and I just wanted to get a sense for like, could my laptop do 10 words? You know, how would it, did it take a second or an hour? Like, you know, I wanted to get kind of a, a feel for what, what I was dealing with. And it, if it was really possible, was it worth even trying this or was it actually just going to be impossible? Um, and so I did my first test, um, 
with eight words because I, I assumed he was going to, he said three or four. So I was trying to prepare for worst case. I was like, can I do it with eight? Like, that's the real question because he's, he's going to let it sit. He's going to let eight words be out there for at least a couple of days. So can I do eight words in one day? It was sort of my target. I was like, I want to be able to do it in a day. Um, and, and when I wrote the, wrote the program and ran it on my laptop, which is maybe four or five years old at this point, uh, it didn't look good. Uh, it was going to take, I forget what I wrote. I think it's like 25 years, something like that. Um, so I was like, okay, well, my computer is kind of old and I know I can probably use graphic cards. So anyways, the next step, like I said, was to toss it up on, um, I spun up a virtual server on DigitalOcean with like 32 cores or something like that, just to see. Um, it got a little better, but um, still infeasible. I forget. I forget the number, but it was it was something like a thousand days or something like that, like three years. Um, and so I was like, okay, I need, or maybe it was nine thousand. I was like, I need at least a thousand times performance improvement uh, from this to to make this doable in a day. And I wasn't sure. I, again, I was like, I don't know if that's possible, but I know that you know, in the early days of Bitcoin mining, we quickly transitioned to GPU mining, which is using is basically calculating the SHA two fifty six hash and whatever else. Um, is needed to mine Bitcoin using a graphics card. And so I was like, maybe I can do the same thing um, with this. I mean, this is basically the same thing. Unfortunately, it's SHA-512, which is a slightly different algorithm, but um, I knew that they were a lot faster and I didn't know how fast, how much. I was like, I was, I'm not sure I'm gonna get a thousand times, but maybe. And so I was like, let's, let's, let's do it. Um, and so I kind of took, I sort of was hoping that there would be, I knew there's all these like hash, there's all these apps out there like, Hashcat and John the Ripper, and it's for people who try to brute force basically leaked password databases. And so I was like, they already have these like GPU implementations. I thought it would be really easy just to kind of borrow some of this open source code and just get a test out there. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't that simple. Um, and so I was like, I'm going to go and learn about uh, programming a graphics card, which I had never looked into before, but was actually really interesting. And uh, I wrote about some of the high level things I learned, which is like, it's, it's like the graphics card processors by themselves are actually slower than your normal CPU, which is interesting. Uh, and it makes sense, I guess, when you think about it, but um, when used for general purpose programming, at least, you know, doing matrix multiplication, it's definitely faster, which is sort of its main purpose in AI and video games and things like that. But if you want to write a general purpose program that does whatever you want, um, they're actually typically slower than your CPU. And the real advantage comes in in the sense that they have um, thousands of cores. I forget like a NVIDIA 2080 Ti, which is sort of like the leading edge consumer graphics card. I think it has something like 5,000 cores. And, you know, your, my laptop had two or four. Um, and so, you know, I was like, well, right there, that's, you know, a thousand times more cores. Maybe I'll get a thousand times imp improvement that I need. Um, and that's just from one graphics card. And then I was like, you can also scale up the number of graphics cards you use. Um, and so I kind of went down this rabbit hole of figuring out what I needed to kind of implement uh, to be able to run this on a graphics card. And eventually using kind of pulling together a bunch of different open source C projects. Um, luckily, that you know, the, the programming language you use on a graphics card is actually really similar. Um, to normal C programming. And so there's tons of open source work around this, especially like libsec p256k1, which is uh, the library, the elliptic curve math library that Bitcoin uses. Um, and I was able to find, you know, all the other things I needed as well. And, and it was mostly a matter of porting them over to actually run um, on the graphics card, including all the logic to do the enumeration of, um, all the mnemonics and converting to seeds and, and, and kind of doing all of the steps with, with this code. And so anyways, at the end of the day, I ran it on a, I got it working and ran it on one 2080 TI that I rented on this, that's that site vast.ii, which is a really cool website to where people can kind of rent out their, rent out their unused graphics cards. So if you have an old mining rig or I don't know where these people have, why they have eight graphics cards, they play really, high resolution games, I don't know. Um, but you know, when you're sleeping or they're just idle, being idle, you can rent them out to, I think it's typically used for AI, hence the, the domain name, but 
Um, so when people want to train these models, they need lots of graphics uh, graphics cards, lots of computing power to, to do the training. And so this is kind of a cheap way to, to get access to lots of graphics cards without having to, like when you typically go to like an Amazon or uh, AWS or Google Cloud or all these providers, you're going to pay uh, quite a bit more to, to rent um, to rent these yep. cards, then it's actually a lot harder to access them. They make it this vast website made it extremely easy to, for me to to get access and up and running without really much onboarding at all. Yeah. So uh, let's talk a little bit about then. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go on. Yep. I was just gonna to kind of f f uh, finish there. Uh, when I ran my first test on the graphics card, I saw that it was going to take about eighty days. And I was like, well, that's a lot better than 25 years, but it's still not good enough. So I would need, you know, but, but if I rent 80 graphics cards, you know, maybe I'd be able to do it in one day. And that was sort of how I found this vast website and realized I was going to have to orchestrate this whole mess of 80 plus graphics cards uh, to get it done in a day. Um, so, so at the end of the day, it was a multi-step process figuring out whether or not it was possible, but it, I kept having an inkling that it was and kept pushing on basically. Yeah, right. And I guess uh, just to get an idea of the numbers, I think from your article, you said you spent about $350 worth of GPU time. And at the time, you know, we're recording now, Bitcoin price is around $9,000, right? So it's, yeah, uh, yeah that's kind of that was just the, the straight numbers, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's sort of what I was thinking. I was like, well, I'm like, assuming my code is right, assuming the derivation path is right, assuming this is the address format. Like, I made a lot of assumptions, but I was like, if my assumptions are correct, then I should be okay spending, I don't know, at least, at least, I mean, even a couple thousand dollars if I was pretty confident I was going to get it. Um, I also assumed, I don't know if anyone else was out there doing this, but if you were, like, reach out to me and be fun to chat. But I, I was assuming there were a lot of people trying to do this. Um, and so I was scared that even if it worked, I would get beat, you know, in a race, someone who had access to, I don't know, a thousand GPUs or something. I like some of these old miners, right? Like a lot of these people have like these huge GPU GPU farms that they're using to mine Ethereum and whatever. They could have been like, oh, this is this is a nice, you know, I might as well go grab this Bitcoin with my ten thousand GPUs. You know, I thought I would get crushed that way, but it didn't seem to happen. Um Great. And look, yeah, let's chat yeah. a little bit about, I guess, just for listeners who might be a bit scared at this point, they're thinking, whoa, hang on, like, does that mean my <laughs> my Bitcoins are unsafe? Uh, can you just outline a little bit around, you know, tips uh, and ways listeners can think about that uh, and, you know, the, the relative levels yeah. of safety that we're talking about? Yeah, so it's, it's back to this idea that I think it comes up a lot in humans. Like we always think linearly, like even in predicting the future, we're like, oh, well, in five years, the last five years this happened. So in five years, like it's going to be like this. But a lot of things like technology grow exponentially and it's sort of the same in this case, like each word or each, uh, each you know, each each bite or each bit, sorry, that of, of the seed that gets leaked it, or is actually like makes it exponentially easier, right? And so... Um, the basically the the tip is don't put your words on on twitter <laughs> it's, it's, it's private uh it's sort of the secret but like yeah i ran some numbers afterwards because everyone kept that was sort of the number one question was like well how long would it take why don't you just do it for all 12 words and you'll get all the bitcoin i was like yeah that sounds nice um but it's something like <laughs> 400 quadrillion like it's it's you know the universe is probably going to end before i would be able to do it um, not to say that, you know, computing power is not going to continue to increase, but it's just, it's so like unfathomable, like to, to do that in, with today's hardware. And so, um, you, your Bitcoin is safe, uh, from this type of attack, at least, uh, there are lots of ways uh, <laughs> that, uh, it can be attacked, but, uh, but generally it, it just, I mean, don't, don't give out your seed, uh, seed and keep it. Yeah. I mean the stuff, obvious stuff, right. Um, and, yeah, uh, um, obviously just be wary about, you know, trying to do those, uh, what's called uh, colloquially scrapping, right. Where you take half your seed and put it somewhere else and things like that. I mean, yeah, yeah. it's an interesting debate. I saw Giacomo and some other, I forget who it is like JW Weatherman or something. I don't know. Anyway, there's a, there is some debate on this uh, and I, I'd like to, I've never really thought about it still. I, I saw people that do it I, and, and it depends. I think it depends on the, the threat that you're trying to protect against, right? Like technically, if you just leave all 12 words in one spot and someone gets to that spot, well, now they definitely get your Bitcoin. Whereas if you did split it and they get to one spot, 
they still probably get your Bitcoin, but at least it's going to take them, uh, you know, a couple of days if they assume they even can do the, the brute force. Um, and so I think it gains you something in certain scenarios, right? Like, um, so, so I don't know the full argument why people are so against it. To me, it seems like it, it does gain, get you, you, you gain something. I, I don't, I don't really know. Maybe you can elaborate if you know the other side of the argument better, but I'm not, I'm not too familiar with it. Right. Yeah. I think the general argument is I understand is more like kind of in the direction that people are talking about, say multi-sig and for other reasons as well of like when you need to like rotate a key or when you need to like do a new setup or what do you do now that you've already given those words out? Like it, it's kind of the practical components, the practical management of it. But it's interesting you have that view as you're one of the guys who did do the brute forcing. So if anything, you would be one of the people who would say like, look, I just did... Um, but that, we've got to remember, again, as you said, it's an exponential thing. You did four words of a 12-word seed, right? When you start yep. talking about, say, a 24-word seed and it's 12 and 12, well, maybe that's still really difficult, right? So, yeah. Um, but yeah. look, I also wanted to chat about Juggernaut. So uh, your project, um, I, I had a chance to just play around with it last night. I think it's really cool. Uh, tell us a little bit about Juggernaut. What is it and why did you make it? Yeah, uh, so Juggernaut is a messaging application um, built on top of the Lightning Network. And so I mostly made it as a way to ex start exploring some of the new technologies we're seeing being enabled by the Lightning Network. So uh, I don't know if everyone's familiar with the Lightning Network, but the Lightning Network is this layer two built on top of Bitcoin, where one of its main purposes is to enable fast and uh, low fee transactions because it's too expensive and slow to do it on the main chain. And that sort of was like the, the core ideas behind it. But recently we've seen things like key send payments uh, be enabled, which is this idea of being able to send a payment, uh, sort of like a Bitcoin payment where you have, uh, uh, you can send it to someone's node directly without them having to generate an invoice first. And when you do that, you can also include some arbitrary data in the payload. And uh, one of the LND developers put out a kind of a command line tool prototype of him making these payments to someone's node directly in, in, and the arbitrary data happened to be a message. And so he sort of was showing how you could build a messaging application that utilize the Lightning Network's encryption and routing properties uh, to have sort of a decentralized uh, messaging system. And so I thought that was really cool and something we haven't really seen before. Um, and I wanted to kind of run with it and and, and explore what might be possible uh, in the future. And so it's sort of just a prototype and an example of of what it might look like it sort of looks a lot like telegram or kind of a, a messenger app you might be used to um but there's no telegram servers there's no juggernaut server you know it's just it's literally every message is routed over the lighting network um, yeah and yeah that's, that's so i guess the idea is it might offer some level of uh res sensor resistance right like it's difficult for somebody to stop that message theoretically uh and so i guess how how should people think about it if they want to think about using the lightning network for messaging versus say signal or wire or telegram and so on yeah it's i'm not sure how practical it is at least today um because there's a lot to get to get started, right? You need to you need to have some Bitcoin. You need to have a Lightning node. You need to have Lightning channels open. You need to pay routing fees. Like it, it's it's a lot. Like it's a lot harder than just like I double clicked on the Telegram app and there we go. Um, but the the main difference is this idea that I keep coming back to, and I talk to a lot of people in the Bitcoin space, and I don't get good answers. But um, there's there's a lot of people in like outside of Bitcoin as well that are doing this, you'll see it, all these, you know, all the shit coins and all these other projects, they're not, they're not decentralized because they're the ones bootstrap, like this company is running the network. It's, you know, it's their node. There's one, there's a couple people running nodes. And so it, it's, it's sort of this problem you keep seeing where like, you don't, are you really decentralized? Do you really have censorship resistance? If, if there's just three people that someone can, the government can go after to shut down your project, it's like, well, not really. And so, to me, that's one of the hardest things to do in any of these new projects is like, how do you bootstrap a truly like censorship resistant network? And it's one of these things where I don't know if anyone can do it again. Like it's sort of like this thing that happened with Bitcoin and it's sort of this gift we have. I don't know. I, it's, no one seems to be able to replicate it and I don't know if they can. And so my idea there is like, 
if we can't actually bootstrap another network, then you ha we have to build on top of on Bitcoin and Lightning. And so that's sort of the nice, that's sort of, for me, the key thing there is that it it's using this all, like it, the, the network exists for a different purpose already. And people are already running these nodes for, for using Bitcoin or for using Lightning. And this app happens to just, I'm not trying to build a new network that uh, um, I have to convince thousands of people around the world to run my node. Uh, I can, I can, we can bootstrap on top of this already existing network. And so that I think is sort of the most important part uh, to me. It's like, it's same with Telegram and Signal. So if we look at them, right, they're, they're end to end encrypted, they're open source, anyone can run it, and, you know, sure. Like, but there are still, you know, Telegram runs the main s servers and you're still using them uh, when you, your messages are routed through them. So they can collect metadata around who you're messaging, how often you're messaging. Yeah, they can't see the actual content of the message, but um, but no one's really running their own Telegram. I mean, maybe some people like, are doing it, but like most like most people just use the Telegram servers. And so I think even you know them and Signal, everyone just has this problem of like, how do you incentivize someone to actually run your your node and build your own decentralized network. And so to me, that's one of the interesting things about Lightning and trying to trying to explore what apps might be possible to to build on top of it because you don't have to worry about the problem of bootstrapping a new network you can just use the one that we already have um, fantastic yeah. i love that idea i think it's very clever because um it's just difficult to get people to run service for something else right people talk about even getting enough tor exit relay exit nodes and yeah, tor relay exactly. nodes tor and so, has on. This problem. Yep. so so it's a great idea um so listeners i i gave juggernaut a try last night i found it very simple i i uh just double click install. Um, and then basically I got my LND connect string uh, and then pasted that into Juggernaut. And then uh, I found a pub key of uh, one of my listeners and uh, did some chat with them and then was able to do payment to them and also payment requests. So uh, listeners definitely um, go and have a look, give it a try. Um, so John, have you got any thoughts around mobile client and any feedback so far on Juggernaut? Yeah, so mobile it would definitely be be doable. I've kind of stepped back a little bit to rethink uh, everything because all the feedback I got was not as easy, it was not as great as yours it just was. Um, almost everyone, even people in Bitcoin, like investors in Bitcoin, like people building other services, they, they actually don't run Lightning nodes, it seems like. And so it's like the no, a lot of people couldn't even like make it to trying the app because they don't have the the requirements. And so to me, it kind of highlighted that the onboarding to Lightning and Bitcoin in general is just, it's just too hard. And I think, you know, it's this week was actually interesting. We saw Square Crypto come out with some more grants for a lot of the design and UX work and it's, it's needed badly. And um, to me, that's sort of now what I think might have to become my number one focus is is on onboarding and maybe directly onto Lightning is sort of where I'm thinking because you already have you know Swan and Coinbase and a lot of these people focused on onboarding people into Bitcoin, um, but there's not a lot of people like making it super easy to to get onto Lightning. I mean, there there are a bunch of mobile apps, but a lot of them are making trade offs that I'm not sure. There's no, again, you come back to these trade offs like uh, to make it easier to use, you have to give up some of the censorship resistance and decentralization and control of your keys and everything that we like to, to talk about in Bitcoin. And so it is really it's it's a really challenging problem, but I think it might it's, I hope it's worth uh, exploring. And so that's sort of one of my main focuses right now is around that idea is how do you get someone on to lightning, even if it's just like you know, even if it's a dollar worth of sats, just to be able to then enable these type of applications around messaging or using some kind of decentralized service that communicates over Lightning, you don't need a lot of money on it. You just, you know, you can send one sat around and, um, yeah, you, know, you work with the services. Yeah. yeah, it could be that, um, you know, it's a great idea, but sometimes ideas come a little early and uh, maybe people aren't ready for that yet. Uh, so it, it's as you as you point out, it's around getting uh, kind of building those other things to kind of uh, 
as the setup for this to become ready. Exactly. Um, yeah, it's like yeah. someone's got to do it. And so, I don't, yeah, like all these light, there's lots of cool lightning applications we're seeing now, but I imagine they're all having the same problem where like it's sort of not worth it if there's 10 people that are ready to get onto your app. You need to right, build the right. person. Yeah. But it's sort of also a chicken and egg problem where how, how are you going to, why is someone going to onboard onto lightning if there's no apps? It's sort of the classic Bitcoin. I don't know if you want to call. I don't. I don't think it's a problem, but people like to talk about it as a problem. Like, where are the use cases and stuff? Well, I think it's more about the censorship resistant money, like non government yeah. money, and all this stuff. And go listen to the podcast from uh, VJ on what is Bitcoin, and uh, you can, um, you know, you'll have a better idea of the use case there. But anyways, I think it's it's an interesting problem, and I I think it needs to be addressed. And, and I was really happy to see Square Crypto uh, move in that direction because I think it's a problem that hasn't had funding and without funding uh you know not a lot gets done fantastic well look i think that's uh gonna do it for this one thank you very much for joining me john where can listeners find you online yeah right now i'm pretty much only on twitter so at john Cantrell 97 um i'm trying to branch out a little bit but yeah just go just go there and um talk to me uh oh, happy to answer your questions i've got a lot of questions uh, after this article about you know, how can I do this? How can I do that? And, and I'm just going to throw this out there. I, I, I cannot brute force your, uh, the wallet, the wallet from, you know, Bitfinex that holds 10 trillion Bitcoins. Uh, don't stop asking me. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you, John and uh, listeners. You can find my show at Stefan Find me online at Stefan on Twitter. That's it from us. And we'll see you guys in the Citadels.